The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. Well, let's say this Twinkie represents the normal amount of psychokinetic energy in the New York area. According to this morning sample, it would be a Twinkie 35 feet long, weighing approximately 600 pounds. <laughs> That's a big point. One of the problems, not specifically on this issue, just in general, that, uh, that um, uh, let's put it this way, money trumps um, peace sometimes. <laughs> in other words, commercial interests are very powerful interests throughout the world. Part of the issue in convincing people to put sanctions on a specific country is to convince them that it's in the world's interest that they forego their own financial interests. It's time for the most entertaining, informational, and educational show on Talk Radio 49. It's Behind the Curtain with your host, Brad Hicks and Lisa O'Brien. facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? And here we are behind the curtain, the reboot, the inaugural version of the the inaugural event, whatever you want to call it, Michael. I'm so excited to be back here behind the microphone, here behind the curtain. And tonight we have a a wonderful guest, Michael. Uh, kind of ironic that the first show for Behind the Curtain featured a Bigfoot expert. And now we're going to bring on here in just a minute. Not yet, Michael. Calm down. Patience, my friend. Patience. We are going to bring in from the um, Bigfoot researchers of the Hudson Valley, Gail Beatty and Debbie Ray. But first, we're going to welcome all the way from the beautiful city of New Orleans, Lisa O'Brien. Lisa, are you with us? Yes, I am. Good evening. Well, Lisa, we are talking Bigfoot tonight. Uh, of course, Gail Beatty and um, Debbie Ray are going to be joining us here in just a minute from the Bigfoot researchers of the Hudson Valley. A wonderful bio, uh, bio that you put together, Lisa. Just absolutely amazing. You're very welcome. I'm glad. <laughs> I could, I'm glad to do it. Yeah, well, I didn't pass too much of the Arkansas educational system, so forming sentences is kind of tough for me. Well, I'm a paralegal. I have to write. And I'm just illegal, so <laughs> we work together, right? Exactly. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So, Lisa, we're talking Bigfoot tonight, and, of course, in American folklore, Bigfoot or Sasquatch is a hairy, upright, walking, ape-like being who leaves behind large footprints and reportedly dwells in the wilderness, strongly associated with the Pacific Northwest, and in particular Washington State and British Columbia, individuals claim to see the creature across North America. Over the years, the creature has inspired numerous commercial ventures and hoaxes. Folklorists trace the figure of Bigfoot to a combination of factors and sources, including folklore surrounding the European wild man figure, folk belief among loggers and Native Americans, and the cultural increase in environmental concerns. Now, before we bring on Gail Beatty and Debbie Ray, uh, when you think Bigfoot, Lisa, a lot of people instantly go to, you know, the more comedic versions of Sasquatch or Bigfoot, obviously the Jack Slinks commercials. Uh, right. The movie from back in the day with John Lithgow, Harry and the Hendersons. Harry and the Hendersons, yeah. But we're talking yeah. about a creature that supposedly has been caught on film. I believe we were just talking about that before we came on the air here uh, at Willow Creek. 
and some of the most compelling footage um, that we've seen, you know, of course, we've heard reports of people in Texas or big game hunters killing them and, and, and all. Now, those have turned out to be hoaxes to a degree. Right. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that the world is a vast place. And there's a lot, a lot of undeveloped land. Fortunately, for a human, for the human race, there is a lot of still undeveloped land, which I love. I love the wilderness. I love nature. And you talk about up in some of the mountains, and 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 like they said in British Columbia, you have to think that there's the possibility that this exists. Oh, definitely. And and definitely. so there, there are and there are areas that. Humans can't survive in, but these creatures may. So yeah. anything is possible. Right, and, uh, and you know, Lisa, when you when you think about it, and, and we're going to bring Gail and Debbie on in just, just a minute, but if you think about it, you know, setting this up, uh, you, there there's, and we're going to get into some of the evidence, some of the experiences that they've been through, what got them into uh, the Bigfoot research. Obviously, you have to have some form of belief in this, and, and and they'll probably allude to that because, let's face it, I mean, honestly, in society, most uh, people are going to, to look at you and go, really, Bigfoot, serious? You know, and that's why we do this show, because we're going to shed light on some of that stuff that people don't really want to shed light on. So we welcome everybody, and we're going to go ahead and bring Gail Beatty and Debbie Ray on of the Bigfoot Researchers of the Hudson Valley. How are you doing this this evening? Almost said this afternoon. <laughs> We're doing great, and we thank you both for uh, having us on tonight. Thank you. We're, We're very happy. Mm -hmm. We're glad to have you. Thanks. <laughs> All the way so, from New York. <laughs> absolutely. Ooh, Clinton country. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Oh, no. But we do appreciate you for coming on. So I guess we'll start with with Gail or Debbie. Um, you guys are with the Bigfoot Research uh, researchers of the Hudson Valley. Go ahead and, and tell us about your the group and 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 how you got started in all this. Okay, so I started the group in 2011, but I had an encounter as a teenager. Up behind my house, I grew up on a, a place called Fissing Mountain in the town of Pine Plains, New York, in Dutchess County. And I was up on the mountain one night um, camping alone. And I never had fear up there. I used to always go up there. I had this little spot up on the mountain that I just would hang out. I loved nature, hunting, fishing, horseback riding, milking cows, the whole nine yards. And... So I was up there, and I was planning on spending the night up there alone. And it happened probably around 8.30 or so. It was in the summer. And um, I had my tent set up in, at the base of a tree in the clearing, a little clearing. And I heard this loud owl. Like, it sounded so loud. You know, nothing like a regular normal owl would sound. It was the, the volume was very, very, you know, loud. So I was like, okay, it's just an owl. Don't be scared. The next thing happened um, a few seconds later was the loudest, most terrifying scream, yell, howl, whatever, you know, that shook my chest. It was so strange and unearthly sounding that I just was paralyzed with fear. And I couldn't move. I, I didn't know what it was. It wasn't any normal, you know, animal in the forest, like a bear or a mountain lion or anything like that. So I sat there for a while. I don't know how long, but I was frozen. And then I said, if I don't get out of here, you know, whatever this thing is, is going to kill me. So I just bolted out of the tent, slid down like in, uh, this ravine that I had to climb up and ran across the yard and burst into the house. And my parents are like, what's the matter? You're white, you're crying, shaking. And I said, something is up on that mountain, and it's after me. 
And so at that point in time, I never heard of back in the late 60s. So I never heard of Bigfoot. Possibly I might have heard of Yeti, a Yeti, but I, I don't even think I did. So it wasn't until 2011 when the show Finding Bigfoot came out that I heard that same sound, you know, and I was watching the show and I said, oh, my God, that's what it was. It had to be. So then I got right on my computer and Googled Bigfoot sightings in Dutchess County, which is, you know, where I live. The first one that came up was a daytime sighting by two women, a road crossing on the road where I lived, on Lake Road in Pine Plain. And I said, holy God, you know, this, these things are here. They're, they're real. So from there, I just started going on um, YouTube, watching people's videos, um, you know, connecting with other people that were, you know, curious about the subject. And then I decided to start um, my own group, and I started interviewing local farmers in the area and finding out that, yes, my father saw one. Um, one, you know, like other people have had experiences that would, you know, not like want to tell a lot of people at the time. So they would hold it in like from the 50s. I've had people that, you know, have finally come forward and said, you know, this happened. I saw one, you know, by a creek holding a dead rabbit. I've had them, you know, running around my house, backing the side of the house. And so that's when, you know, the... I just became passionate about finding out the truth about these creatures. So that's what I did. And believe me, there's a lot of people out there doing the same thing more and more every day. So that's how I got started with the group. So now and, uh, you said that you, this was that your first experience that you talked about was in 19, in the sixties. Yeah, in the late 60s, probably 68, I'm, I'm thinking, around 1968. Oh. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so, but it wasn't until you witnessed this show years and years later that you kind of, did, that it just dawned on you? Like, it just, whoa. Yeah, the connection, yeah, it just clicked because I heard that howling that, um, I think it was maybe um, Ron Moorhead's put out the Sierra sounds, maybe it was that, or, you know, someone had, like, the howling, the same type that I heard, like that horrible, it, it just goes right through you, and the volume was, ugh, it was scary, I thought I was going to die, I was terrified. I can, oh, I, that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm visualizing this in my mind as you were telling that story, and you know, as an being from Arkansas, you know, and an avid hunter, you know, having been in the woods at three or four o'clock in the morning, setting up, getting ready to go, you know, mm. you, you're used to, yep. you're acclimated to certain sounds like twigs breaking and and animals moving in and about the forest and the woods and all that. But yeah, from what you're describing, I mean, Lisa, can you imagine, you know, being in the woods and hearing that? Um, I just, I honestly am, am sitting here trying to figure out what I would do and probably changing, changing residence would be the number one thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't, I can't even imagine that. I, I don't know what I would have done except mm-hmm. crawled into the sleeping bag and zip myself up till morning. Yeah, no, I was too scared. I I was like, whatever it was, was right outside the tent. And all it had to do was grab me. And, oh, God. I don't oh. know. Yeah, it was like a fight or flight type of thing. Like, I just yeah. knew I had to try to get away from it, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it was crazy. But since then, you know, I still continue to hunt. Um, you know, it was always in the back of my mind, like, what the heck was it, you know, but I always, like, you know, just kept it in the back of my mind that something might be out there, but I never even heard of the Bigfoot, even when the Patterson-Gimlin thing came out, and I think that was in 67, was it, Deb? Somewhere. uh, Yeah, Yeah, something like that, but it just didn't, you know, really register, I guess. 
you know, it just didn't. I felt safe in the woods, you know, and plus I was hunter, so I would have a shotgun with me most of the time when I was out deer hunting or pheasant hunting. So, you know, you think, okay, if something did come after you, you could shoot it. But now we find out that that would only piss them off. You know, you don't yeah. want to pull a gun on them, no way. They're not usually alone. They travel, you know, in clans, family units. So that's the last thing you want to do. <laughs> no, definitely yeah. not. Yes. So that was my first experience. And I've had others since then. And how Debbie and I met, and I'll let her tell you her story, and then you'll know how we met. Okay. I I met Gail uh, three years ago this week. <laughs> We're having a sentimental <laughs> moment. Uh, uh, we had a lot of snow that winter, and I had a guy taking the snow off my roof. And I had just broken my leg, too, so I was hobbling around through three feet of snow. And I'm out there talking to him. And I'm standing out in the sunshine and watching him shovel up the roof. And I turned around and I looked at the yard and uh, I see deer tracks and normal, very normal, because I live near the Hudson River and there's woods in the back of my house. So I'm, I'm just looking around and then I see something else that caught my eye and I turned around again and they were footprints. I went, holy cow. And I said to the guy on my roof, what the heck is that? He just laughed at me. So uh, I went in, got my iPad, took pictures, and I was really, really confused what it could be. I measured them, 14-inch footprints, six feet apart, and they went clear across my yard and then stopped abruptly and kind of following the deer tracks. So I walked around the house talking to myself for a little bit, and I Finally, a friend of mine said, you know, call the local police, see what they say. So I took the pictures, went over there, and I said, can you tell me what this is? Because I swear, if you tell me this is a porcupine, you know, uh, that's fine. I'll, you know, I'll take it. They looked at the pictures, and they said, uh, oh, where do you live? And I said, you know, over um, off Route 9. And they said, oh, we're going to follow you home. We'll go look at them. I said, great. So they came over, looked. The two of them whispered to each other. I, I was just a couple of feet away from them. I couldn't hear a word they said. But anyway, they looked at me and they said, you'll be all right. It's deer. So I looked at them like, sincerely, I don't believe you, but not that I was looking for anything. So I said, okay, great. See you. Thanks for coming over. So it bothered me all week. I kept looking at them. There were definitely toes in, in there. It, it was a footprint. So uh, I, on Friday night, I got frustrated. I just Googled Bigfoot researchers in Dutchess County and up popped Gail's name. So I waited till Saturday morning, 9 o'clock in the morning. I rang her house phone here, and uh, I talked to her, and she was very nice. And um, I emailed her. As I'm talking to her, I emailed her the pictures, and she's looking. She said, oh, you have something going on there. And she said, we're going to come down and look. So they did, and they videotaped, and reassured me, and um, I wasn't nervous, um, but uh, Gail, Gail is an incredible woman. I, I She's the, one of the gutsiest ladies I've ever met. You know, just dives headfirst into a dead deer carcass or deer, you know, or, or a cow or whatever, whatever we find in the field. She's like, oh, look at that. And she's in it. she investigates, tries to see what killed this animal, um, She's always ready to go. Um, I, I really admire her for, for how she she uh, gets into this. And she welcomed me with open arms, and we've just kind of been joined at the hip since then. So uh, we enjoy going out, and we think alike. So um, what else can I, I tell you? That, that's about it. It's uh, yeah, jumping deer. Yeah, jumping deer. I, that wasn't jumping deer. It, it wasn't that deep, and there were other – deer tracks so it you know i just looked at them but gail came down and said no i I don't think they're going to bother you and when she went around my whole property and down by the river being i live near the hudson river and the amtrak track um she found lots of footprints uh smaller and the big ones too it was like grand central station way over in the corner of the woods so i i said okay so when i talked to my girlfriend she said well 
on Valentine's Day, they were leaving the yacht club they had set up for a Valentine's Day party. She said, 4 o'clock, we were going home to change to come back for the party. And as they crossed the railroad tracks, she looked to to the south towards my house, and um, there was something big and black. Now, there was a blizzard going on. Let, Let me just picture that. It was super cold. The snow was coming down sideways and windy, and it wasn't a day you'd want to go take a stroll. And she she looked, and there walking next to the railroad track was a Bigfoot. And she didn't quite believe it until I had this story. She said, "Wonder, I wonder if that was the same one that walked through your yard. I said, well, that's possible. I said, with 14-inch feet, absolutely it could be. So uh, a few days later, um, we got a report from somebody on, on Facebook, and they said, oh, yeah, my, my cousin's an engineer on Amtrak, and he was going north to Albany, and he reported seeing what he said was a Bigfoot. The only thing he reported was it wasn't normal. It wasn't human. So he said, big black walking in the snow. So I said, okay, that was the same guy that was at my house. So uh, I think he's been back to at my house. Yeah, I've had other prints. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we think that she has a clan because um, not only we casted those tracks, but since then, Debbie has had quite a bit of activity. Uh, Branches breaking, um, trees breaking, not just branches, but trees placed um, upside down with the root ball sticking up in the air, Um, noises, uh, stuff coming up on the back porch, knocking off plants and stuff off the porch. Um, little tracks. We've got, I think, three small tracks, and then uh, this uh, fall or this spring, they a big 18-inch track right in her front flower bed, right outside of her front door. So for some reason, we believe it's because they travel the waterways, railroad tracks, and power lines at night, usually. And we believe that, you know, this is like a highway for them. And plus she's got a lot of, um, you know, there's a little pond behind her house and the Hudson River. So we know that they eat uh, fish, uh, they eat frogs and uh, muskrat and beaver and all kinds of stuff. So they have a smorgasbord behind her house, I guess. So, yeah. So when dealing with 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 Bigfoot and it's that, do you guys have a, any kind of comprehension or understanding of of its behavioral patterns or uh, you know things of that nature, like like a dietary? Like I know you said fish and whatnot, but you know yeah. uh, uh, maybe it's behavior, like aggressiveness or anything of that nature. Obviously, you yeah, know they can be but, aggressive. Yeah, um, here in New York. I've had a couple of, like, pretty scary encounters while, you know, researching with the team. And, um, you know, they live in family units, like I said. And one day, uh, five of us, five or six of us went to this place where we knew there were a lot of Bigfoot in this area. And we had split up. And uh, so two of the team members took this high trail and myself and another fella took a lower trail. And we were supposed to meet up at a certain point. So me and the other fella, you know, we were doing our research. We found, like, a a dog-like canine track that day. And, you know, that was pretty scary. We can talk about the dog man later, but we think it was a dog man track. So the other two were up on the higher trail. They stopped to get a drink of water, and they took their backpacks off, and they started to drink the water, and Connie Emming, our other team member, who now lives in Kentucky, but she had was filming, and she put the camera down, and all of a sudden, this noise, like really loud, whack, 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 like something was thrashing, you know, a big stick against a tree, and just then, I had, I guess I texted them, and I said, where are you? And she said, is that you making that loud noise? And I said, no, I, we wouldn't do that. 
And so they just grabbed their backpacks, took off running, met up with us. We get home, review the footage, and sure enough, there was a female Bigfoot, had a little infant clinging to her left shoulder, a juvenile in front of her, and the juvenile had a stick in his hand and the mother had a stick. So, you know, that they were probably just, like, doing that. The mother was, like, saying, you know, stay away. You know, I have young. You know, so they're going to protect their young just like we would or a bear would or any other animal. And we do know quite a bit about, you know, what they eat on their main diet in the winter here are white-tailed deer. And they, they eviscerate, you know, they'll, they'll open up the, the cavity and they'll take the liver, heart, spleen, you know, the, the high-protein organs. And then we do believe that they travel, like the coyotes travel with the Bigfoot, with the Sasquatch, and they will finish off the kill. Like they'll drag their legs, you know, because the Bigfoot, like, just will rip the legs off, twist their heads, break their necks of the deer, and then, you know, take what they want. And then, then you'll hear the coyotes, and they'll start yipping and howling, and they take off the rest of the kill. So we've we've found so much evidence here in the Hudson Valley, and we are two hours north of Manhattan, and there are farms, orchards here. Um, you know, it's a rural area, really. Not as many farms as years ago, but there still are dairy farms and and you know and farms and all kinds of orchards. They do eat blueberries and uh, everything. You know, they're opportunistic feeders. And then we've gotten a couple of reports. Um, The last one we got was from a uh, fast food restaurant in a very highly populated area. Um, And the guy, the manager, takes the... um, garbage out and put it in the dumpster at midnight and he walked around to open up the dumpster and he heard something behind it and he put his phone light on and there was a female Bigfoot (laughs) standing there like, you know, rooting through the garbage and he happened to go out at the same time and this is in a very populated area of Route 9 so, you know, you don't know the area obviously but it's like a city, and there was a female Bigfoot that was in, you know, rooting around for a blizzard or a French fries or chickens or something. So they, we know that they, they do, you know, come into the areas and you know try to get garbage or you know cattle food or dog chow stuff like that. They do that. Right, you know, and I guess the closest thing uh, here in Arkansas that we've had was, and I'm you you may know it was in Miller County, um, Folk, Arkansas, the Boggy Creek Monster, which yep. was yeah, um, that you know that was what in the 1970s, the early 70s, and I'm guessing from what I've been reading over the last couple of days is that a lot of this. <clears throat> The I guess the height of the Bigfoot phenomena, maybe it was just because it was kind of the beginning as well, was in the 60s and 70s. And uh, obviously now the evolution of technology has allowed for, you know, game cameras. And here recently, it's a, I have one myself. I'm, a, I'm an avid storm chaser, um, and I carry a drone with me now uh, for yeah. aerial shots. And I noticed yep. uh, in doing some research just just now while you were talking and kind of looking at my phone and reading some more and listening to you, I, I stumbled upon a story that was reported out of Northern California. I'm not sure if you've seen it. Uh, a gentleman was actually not intending to to do anything with, with Bigfoot. He was actually pre-planning a, a, um, a, a filming routine or whatnot for the next day. And he yep. caught on the drone an actual picture of a black figure um, yeah. that could be described as a gentleman in a black hoodie and black jeans, but there's no definition of what would be like me or 
anyone else wearing pants and a hoodie. It's a legit figure. Right. Um, when you guys yeah, go research. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, I think I saw that with the drone that he captured it with. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah so before I, I'm going to turn this over to Lisa because I'm sure she has a couple of questions, but before we do that, uh, you you go out on a research. Can you walk us through uh, a typical uh, Bigfoot hunt and, or research uh, mission, the gather and collection, whatever? Yeah, sure. Um, we usually go out with at least four to five people. Um, we stay close together now. We, in the beginning, we were, you know, novices and you know, I'd wander off the trail and go one way and somebody else would go another. But now we stay close together because for safety reasons, of course, because they can just snatch you, you know, and they're real good at hiding. And we know that. And we bring, oh, that's my dog, sorry. But we bring um, camera glasses we wear that by, made by Coleman, and they're video and audio glasses. So we, you know, hands-free. But then we also have little handy cams like Sony um, cameras that you can zoom in. And um, we bring our tape measure, our casting material, um, you know, something for protection. Usually we have, you know, a weapon or, you know, somebody has some kind of a weapon, you know, just because there's bobcats, mountain lions, and coyotes and bears here as well. But um, we just, uh, we know certain areas have the Bigfoot. You know, we have our certain hot spots. So, you know, we just go out and we use Native American techniques. Like as soon as we get out of the car, we smudge with sage, like the Native American sage, and we say a prayer for protection for everyone. Um, sometimes we use holy water, you know, we'll bring holy water. We do everything we can to, you know, ground ourselves and protect ourselves. And then we kind of mentally, like, um, you know, ask permission to come in. Because a lot of people think that the Bigfoot are telepathic, which, you know, I mean, I don't know if you believe in the woo or whatever they call it, the woo, but there are certain aspects to these creatures that can't be explained. You know, there's, there just can't by our normal, you know, way of thinking. So we do all that, we, and then we just go out into an area. We're quietly walking, observing, looking for uh, twisted, broken-off tree branches and you know, high up, some of them, some low to the ground um, structures, which we found hundreds, which we believe that, you know, they do this at night. Like they can change a forest. You know, it could be one way, one day when you go there and you go back the next day and there'll be like a teepee-like structure or you'll find um, pine boughs or cedar boughs um, piled up in a certain area, like in a rounded, you know, thing, almost like an igloo type thing or, you know, a, or like a teepee. Uh, they lean trees against other trees going in certain directions. They Then you'll find arches, like um, they will bend over a sapling and they will place like um, rocks or something to make it into this arch, which we think is like a, a sign to show other Bigfoot, like, go this way, or, you know, there's a clan here. Different rock symbols, um, different sticks that they, uh, we call them glyphs, and they will put them in certain ways, like sometimes, like, an, they would want to look like an H, but different, you know, not exactly an H or a K or, like, a box and they will lay these branches out. But we, we're trying to educate ourselves on looking at Native American glyphs and ruins, R-U-I-N-S, and, you know, trying to figure out what these symbols mean. But um, a lot of the things go back to the Native Americans, you know, because they have they've had contact with these creatures very long time ago. Some tribes believe that they are cannibals, 
other tribes have traded with them in the you know past, and um, other tribes just say leave them alone. This is their territory, like a mountain area or whatever, and they avoid that area at all costs. So there's just so much to learn. I mean, the more you think you know, and then you realize you don't know a fraction about them. You know, they're just so complex and so, you know, there's so many stories out there and so many podcasts, like, with these people that have had terrifying encounters with them. Other people have had not so terrifying. Like, so far, you know, I've been out hundreds of times. Debbie's been out a lot, and we're still here to talk about it. You know, so if they wanted to harm us, they certainly had plenty of opportunity. Yeah, right. Because we've been so close to them, like feet away, and not even seen them until we get home, put our footage in the computer, and we go frame by frame. And then we'll say, oh, my God, there, there they are. There's one right there with, within five feet of us. And we never, ever saw it. So it's it's really, you know, whenever I go out now, I just assume that they're there, you know, and we just try to be passive and we leave them offerings of food as well and offer them tobacco. We gift them with tobacco. Sometimes we put little trinkets out like marbles or a ball with a light inside or, you know, just different things. Sometimes they take them, other times they don't. So we, we've tried a lot of different techniques along the way, as, as other researchers do as well. Like Scott Carpenter, he's in uh, Maryville, Tennessee, and he captured, he was smart enough to put the camera facing behind him. And when he did that, he caught um, Bigfoot and Dogman and this little weird alien creature uh, that was stalking, like flanking behind him. So that's something that we're probably going to, you know, put into our research as well. Now, let me ask you, you ladies, this. Are you familiar with the Melba Ketchum DNA evidence that surfaced about six years ago? Oh, yes. Yep. Yeah, I admire Melba a lot. I mean, she, I've talked to her about the whole thing, and really, people treated her terribly. They they were terrible to her, and she was, a, she's a veterinarian. And, you know, she was trying to just do what, you know, people brought her these samples from all over the place. And according to Melba, the mitochondrial DNA the, the from the mother, is I think it's 97% human, and the nuclear DNA from the father is unknown. So, you know, I, I, other people have, you know, tested different samples, and I just watched a documentary a couple of weeks ago with Brian Sykes um, from Oxford University, and all the samples that brought to him were supposedly from a bear or a raccoon, uh, you know, I don't know. I just, I think the government is trying to keep this a secret from us because a lot of people are outdoorsmen, you know, like you like to go outdoors and hunt and fish and go camping. And if this the, did come to the public light, nobody would be out there, you know. Uh, the economy for that kind of thing would probably go down the toilet. Um, Our friend Claudia Ackley, I don't know if you read about this, but she lives in California, and she has a lawsuit, and that's coming up uh, in a couple of weeks now, uh, to prove the existence of Bigfoot. She is suing the state of California for recognition of the Sasquatch species and their protection. So... I just wanted to put that in out there because it's been on the news. Um, she's a very dear friend of ours, and she's uh, honestly, her and her two daughters went for a walk, and she is a Bigfoot researcher as well. 
and they took a walk, I don't know, I guess last year, or maybe it wasn't even that long ago, March, March of last year, and they came face to face with three Bigfoot. And her daughter, her teenage daughter, I believe she's 14, had the mindset to take out her cell phone and put it on video. And she's got a video clip of these Sasquatch. And the one was up, the big one was up in the tree, rocking back and forth. And the kids were terrified, of course. And Claudia got them out of there, and they weren't harmed. But she called the DEC officer. The woman came out to her house, and she... Claudia told her what they had seen. You know, the kids were crying. They were shaken up, of course. And the the, uh, female officer said, no, you saw a bear. And Claudia said, no, I saw three Sasquatch. We all saw them. No, you saw a bear. So Claudia got, you know, mad. And I don't blame her because people should know these things are real. They're out there. They're around houses, churches, schools. I mean, I've had a, found a nest right up on my property on the creek um, last, about two or three years ago. A nest. I found, I've seen them on my property. Debbie saw one last, when? In August. In August, when she was leaving, pull, pulling around in my driveway, and a big black one ran from the front of my house to the creek, to the woods, and I passed the track the next day. I mean, they're here, and we live right, there's there's an elementary school right up the road, not even an eighth of a mile from me. And they've been up there. And they've been up there, yeah, because we found kills. We found so much evidence, and yeah, yeah. So uh, why the government just doesn't say, look, they're here, you know, leave them alone, or, you know, if you see one, just back away slowly or whatever, you know, like warn people. And that's what Debbie and I are trying to do. We give presentations at schools, at camps, trying to educate the public that, you know, if you do have a face-to-face encounter, look them straight in the eye, just put your head down, you know, in a a nice gesture, put your hands up, like, you know, in, in like a submissive pose or something, turn around and leave, you know, but I don't know. If Claudia well, that's, gets uh, that will be good. <laughs> well, I was going to say that the case that you're talking about, uh, I actually read on that, and the interesting mm-hmm. part of that is that she actually filed that suit with Todd Standing, who uh, directed the Netflix film Discovering Bigfoot. Yes. Um, yes. And that was actually Lake Arrowhead near the San Bernardino Mountains. And they describe it like a Neanderthal-looking creature with with tons of of hair, black hair. So, you know, I mean, the government, look, the government hasn't admitted a ton of things. So why would they start now, you know? Yeah, I know. I know. I know. It's frustrating. (laughs) I mean, there's... There's there's Area 51 and all of that, uh, you know, and that's the only, obviously, a, a secret military base. But, you know, getting away from that, um, that, that lawsuit is interesting to me, you know. Um, well, you know, Lisa being a, pod Lisa up real fast, Lisa being a, a paralegal and, and all. I wanted to right. ask Lisa, your opinion on that lawsuit that the... Miss Claudia filed in the state of California for the existence of Bigfoot as a paralegal. You know, what is your take on that? Well, the similar one filed by a, a gentleman, I think, in uh, British Columbia and Canada. You know, I don't know because this is a an issue that there's not really any hard evidence I mean I don't think they can even meet a a preponderance of the evidence standard to prove that the uh, species exists so I, I don't know how successful traditional court proceedings are going to be because uh, we don't have because they're so elusive and it's not right. for lack of it's just that uh, the bits and pieces that people have gathered over the, over the years aren't uh, aren't enough to 
prove more likely than not that they're real. Right. Yeah, and unfortunately. you see it with your own eyes. Right. Uh, but even it's, if you it's do. Very difficult. Yeah. Right. Proof, yeah, they want like a body. That's what everyone says that, you know, if you bring them the body. But you know what? If you've got a body, you would have to go like down to the middle of Manhattan, not call any police or anything, and just like right. sit on the front steps of the police department or, you know, get the news to come out because otherwise they'll confiscate the body. They will Correct. confiscate. Yeah. Correct. And it's it's very uh, sad. You know, I, I it's a novel theory. Mm-hmm. Um, and I certainly will keep up and, th- and you know, follow it to see what ultimately happens. Yeah. But the problem is, is that she's bringing a lawsuit, so mm-hmm. she bears a burden of proof. Right. Exactly. And she's already starting off on uh, kind of behind the eight ball because she does not have, aside from the video that she, her daughter shot. Right. She doesn't really have any other evidence besides that. Yeah. And obviously they're, I, I think people, when they're afraid of the unknown, they mm-hmm. want to pretend that it doesn't exist. Oh, yeah. Right. right. I think exactly. that's, I think that's more behind it. Yeah, definitely um, fear. fear. And, you know, people, if they don't see it with their own eyes, they're not going to believe it. No. Well, no. well, Lisa, I wanted to know, you know, you study um, you study law and whatnot. I'll share this link with you and, and uh, Gail and Debbie as well. Um, there's an article on Gizmodo. I'm not sure if you know where that's at or not, but uh, it actually, the headline here says that uh, the Bigfoot lawsuit against California actually makes some really good points. Um, Reading this, uh, this is from the Superior Court of the State of California in the Statement of Facts. It says, respondents are, are or ought to be aware that the State of California is home to a large wild indigenous mammal considered to be a giant hairy vertebrae, hominoid or primate, commonly known as Sasquatch. The Sasquatch, man, I, that's some scientific words I'm not even going to try to pronounce. <laughs> um, but this article here is, it's really interesting because it, it, it actually has, you know, what Lisa studies, and that's like factual well, court documents. Right. Hmm. And let me, um, let me, kind of let you know, this statement of facts is likely from Ms. Ackley's petition. So this is her position in the lawsuit. So, of course, that's the, that's the initial petition. That's what her position is. Now she has to prove the existence of the Sasquatch. Yeah. In California, she has to prove that it's at risk, that it's threatened or endangered. Mm-hmm. And in order to do that, she needs numbers. Right. And that's where I think she's going to fall short mm-hmm. is because right. we don't know. We can right. estimate there you know, must be oh. a lot, but right. we don't know. Right. Um, I, told, I messaged her before um, because we've been talking back and forth and let me run this by you Lisa to see if you think this will help her case if all of the Bigfoot community and you know Debbie I as well any one of us could write a letter and address it to the judge and then uh, you know saying of our encounters or you know that we've seen the Sasquatch we know they exist and send them to Claudia, or then she could bring them to court with her. Would that well, be good or if, no? If her aim, if her aim is to prove this in California, right? Anyone in California who has had encounters uh-huh. can do a declaration or an affidavit. An oh. affidavit is a signed statement given under oath. 
uh-huh. and notarized by a notary public. They oh, can lay out sure. when they saw it, yep. where they saw it, what they saw, a description, mm-hmm. time of day, as much detail as they can recall. Okay. And then they can present those to her mm-hmm. or provide those for her to eventually use perhaps in a motion for summary judgment or in response to a motion for summary judgment filed by the state of California. Great. Oh, thank um, you. But for it that. would be it would it would need to be limited to residents of California. Right. That's what I thought. So people, yeah. people who had encounters while in California, even if yeah. they live outside of California. Right. It, it okay. could end up helping, and that is a good uh, that is a good strategy, a good uh, uh, resource for evidence. Yeah. So this is what people saw with their own eyes. Now, I right. have to ask you, all of the articles that I read said no matter what the species, no matter where in the world they are, they yep. smell horrific. Has that At been your time. experience? Um, okay. Only, only personally one time. Well, actually two. Yeah, okay. Two different times, and but not always. Like, I think that if you come up on them unexpectedly, they do have, like, a you know, some kind of thing that they can give off that horrible odor. But I've only okay. smelled it twice. Pheromones. Yeah, pheromones or whatever they call it. But, like, other times we've, you know, walked right by them, like I said, never smelled and, yeah. anything, so, never yeah. heard anything. I mean, they are okay. so stealthy. It's yeah, but I think if they're stressed, yeah. Or babies in your oh, Yeah. And when okay. Connie and uh, Brian, my two uh, team members, when they uh, had that encounter up on the trail, they smelled what they thought was a dead, rotting deer carcass. Come to find out, it wasn't. It, it was, was the Bigfoot. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, at times, yes. Yes, they will. You know, I've Do talked to have- people that... Why? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's fine. Go ahead. Do you all have any uh, any procedures or of you know reporting and documenting what you do? Not that you necessarily share it online, but uh, is that something that you do? Yeah, do you we have any document. science? Do you have any scientists, zoologists, cryptozoologists affiliated with your organization? No, not really. Um, we do we do have hair samples. I had scat, but I ended up getting rid of it. Um, but we do have like a lot of hair samples. We have about a dozen or more tracks, you know, casts that we right. have made. Um, there are a couple of colleges, local colleges here, that might possibly be able to analyze the hair without charging us like two thousand dollars or whatever. So we're right. gonna look into doing that. Um but like I said, you know, ninety percent of the time these hair samples they come up, oh, they're contaminated by human DNA because you didn't uh, pick them up the right way or store them properly, you know, or they'll say unknown. So if you're gonna go out okay. and spend two thousand dollars find out right. that it's unknown or it's contaminated because it comes back about, human. Have you ever thought about having somebody just do a microscopic analysis just to look yeah. at the structure of yeah. the hair? Yes, the medulla. I'm actually a hairdresser, or I was, so I learned a little bit about, you know, the composition of hair. And you can go online, and I actually have it in my um in my iPad, and it shows you, like, what the different hair from a raccoon or a bear, right. you know, the structure and the medulla. So, yeah, we, we can do that. We can definitely do that. But we're pretty yeah. sure because when we find, like, Debbie, the track at her house, the 14-inch track, had mm-hmm. hair in it. <laughs> so right. it was the brown, you know, Nothing, it didn't look like a raccoon or a bear or a deer. It it had a different texture. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, you would think since they they may be primate, mm-hmm. it, it would probably be closer to uh, primate hair. Right. Right. More like um, than anything like else, bang, like bang. chimpanzee, yeah. orangutan. I think the the main thing is they think it's uh, uh, ancestors of the orangutan. Yeah. Yeah, they, so, they some of them some of them look more ape like and others more human like and the more human like right. ones are called the ancient ones and then the others like people say it looks between a human and an ape and you know it's like it, and they're different colors there's um we had a fella in our group that one night he was a taxi driver and he drove by this area of this habituation site that we were investigating for a couple of years and had crazy stuff going on there. And he saw yeah. this big blonde Sasquatch standing in this person's field. He was selling a, a motorboat and he had it parked out in the field, you know, off the road. And so uh, Michael Patrick was driving the taxi cab and looking, you know, it was 11 o'clock at night, and he sees this Sasquatch about eight foot tall, long, blonde, shaggy hair standing in front of his boat. So he called me in the morning, and my son and I went out there, and sure enough, exactly where he said, we got a track, I forget if it was 16 or 17 inch track of the creature wow. and he said it ran you know he tried to like turn the, the car around and have the headlights hit the field where it took off and he said it ran back into the woods but um wow. yeah they come in all colors like auburn uh black gray um white pure white there's been several of them seen and the uh blonde you know right. they live different sizes colors uh, they're breeding they're breeding here that's what they're doing i mean they've got plenty of food water you know mountains caves and they're prolifically breeding i think mm-hmm. yeah and we may we may see more encounters because our cities and our 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 homes and our our suburbs are spreading out into the green space yes yep we're encroaching so up there as- we encroach, we may see, like, with alligators in Florida and Louisiana. Right, um, right. You, uh, we have two in my subdivision. And they just mm-hmm. hang out on the bank of the canal. Really? They don't bother anybody. Wow. So, wow. No more scared of that. Yeah, I'm pretty scared of them, too. Oh, yeah. Well, if what you about- can outrun them in the first 30 seconds, you're right. Yeah. Wow. So, Always what all, <laughs> uh, all the encounters I've read about about the Bigfoot and Sasquatch, they are incredibly fast. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. The one that was that here? Oh yeah. The one that Debbie saw in, in front of my house that night, it was mm-hmm. like hunched over and when her headlights hit it and it was torrentially raining that night too. And it was so fast. It was like two seconds, you know, and the stride was so big. It was gone. And she didn't know. She didn't tell me. She wasn't going to tell me that night, right? <laughs> no, it was important. And I was back in the car up, and my headlight just happened to hit it. And I looked like, <gasps> and I sat there and said, oh, that was a big foot. And he was booking it. He was so booking it. And I put my hand down to open the door, and I went, yeah, no. If I tell her tonight, she won't sleep. So I waited, and I came up Sunday morning, and I said, I have to talk to you about something. Yeah. She goes, what? what? What's the matter? And I, I told her, and she goes, you're kidding. I said, no, let's go look. And we found the track. It was oh, awesome. wow. Yeah. All right, we're going we're gonna to take a little break here. Okay. okay. We're gonna have to. We're gonna do a little commercial break and okay. have a breather, and then we're gonna get back to the back to the conversation because this is fascinating. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, you are listening to Talk Radio Forty Nine and Behind the Curtain. When we come back, more of Gail and Debbie. 
and the Bigfoot researchers of the Hudson Valley. It's all up next here on Talk Radio 49 and Behind the Curtain. Are you looking for the best deals for your vaping needs and accessories? Then check out the guys at sub Own Vapors. With daily specials on a wide selection of mods and juices, they will surely become your one-stop shop. Ray and the guys at sub Own Vapors, located at 6929 JFK Boulevard, Suite C in North Little Rock, Arkansas, want to see you. Join them on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, but more importantly, visit the store or call 501-392-6487. sub Own Vapors. Vape it like you built it. August 23rd, 1987, Linda Ives' son, Kevin Ives, and Kevin's friend, Don Henry, were murdered in Alexander, Arkansas. Their bodies were placed on railroad tracks, later to be run over by a train. For more than 30 years, Linda Ives has been relentless in fighting to find out what happened to the two boys. And I say all of this because next week, that is, next week, we are a bi-monthly show. We operate every two weeks, but we're going to bring you a special edition of Behind the Curtain this Coming Monday, we're going to have Billy Jack Haynes, the investigator for the case, Mr. Keith, I can't pronounce his last name, I really wish I could, and Linda Ives, the mother of Kevin Ives, one of the two boys found dead on those tracks. Now, I say all this to bring that to the conclusion that this has a lot to do with the MENA connection. Go to YouTube, watch the MENA connection, check it out, get a concept of the story because we're going to bring you that. Go to GoFundMe.com and in there search for Kevin Ives and Don Henry murders. The investigator for the case is doing it pro bono, asking the public for help to help solve this murder, to bring justice to those families, especially Miss Ives, who has dealt with the loss of her son against a corrupt political machine. So that's all going to be next Monday night here on Behind the Curtain, a special episode. Can't wait for that. Billy Jack Haynes bringing new evidence to the case. Of course, tonight's show, we have Gail and Debbie from the Bigfoot researchers of the Hudson Valley on, and we're talking all things Bigfoot. But also, tomorrow, our co-host on this show starts her new show, Clear and Convincing. And before we go off there, she'll tell you about it. That starts tomorrow night. And she's going to break down uh, historic cases, I believe, Michael, Uh, starting with tomorrow, the judicial process, the misconceptions of what the public happens. Do what? A little bit of an intro. Yeah, a little introductory session on that, but that's clear and convincing. Also, if you're into progressive secular politics, you can join Sean Castleberry and Micah Qualls on the On the Real show on Sunday nights that aired this past Sunday night. All of our shows are archived for future listening at your convenience. You like that? Future listening at your convenience. <laughs> uh, we're also out to Stitcher, iTunes, uh, various formats, looking at DTM Wicked as a syndicate. Uh, Going to try to get this out. Again, all these are uh, archived. You can go to Facebook, uh, look up Talk Radio 49. 
You can also go to um, Behind the Curtain. That's a Facebook page as well. Uh, you can do all sorts of things. We're very interactive. If you would like to be a, a guest on the show or have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to email the curtain podcast at gmail.com. The curtain podcast at gmail.com. And if you have a question for one of our guests, feel free as always to either call in to 347 989 1171. That's 347 347- Nine eight nine one one seven one. Also programming here on Talk Radio Forty Nine, ASWF Saturday Night Live Wrestling every two weeks or when it shows from Tuckerman, Arkansas. And then introducing this Thursday, the ASW Aftermath Show returns, uh, talking about all the action inside the Valiant Arena, for which myself, uh, Double J, are a part of that show. Michael Carnahan, the voice of ASWF. So you can listen to that on Thursday nights as well for a little bit of entertainment. And then Michael comes back Wednesday nights, 8 o'clock Central Standard Time, for the best in sports. If it happens in sports, it happens here. It's the Mike and Mike show every Wednesday night. Whew, that's a lot. That's a lot of work. Damn, I'm tired. I'm glad I started vaping. Golly. But anyway, also, big, big key to everybody, July 5th, 2017, the last time that I touched a cigarette. Just saying. Just saying. But anyways, yeah, exactly. Uh, but anyway, again, you got on the record Sunday nights, clear and convincing tomorrow night, making its debut with Lisa O'Brien and Michael Carnahan on the reel. Excuse me. Uh, everybody, you remember Sean from the, uh, on this time slot? He has moved to Sundays with Michael Qualls. It's going to be very interesting. So we're going to bring, we're going to pod Lisa back up real quick before we get back to Gail and Debbie. And uh, Lisa, coming out of that commercial break, so much happening here at Talk Radio 49. It's absolutely becoming a, a, one of your go-tos, I would I would say, just because oh, I'm definitely. on it. That's it? Definitely. She said it. She and there, it. There are, there's a wide <laughs> variety of, of shows. Well, there's me too, Lisa. Yes, there's you. Always, you're, you're the reason I'm here. <laughs> Actually, though... I already got a big head. That's why we're talking Bigfoot, because I need a big foot to go with this big head. <laughs> but, uh, no, seriously, Lisa, you got clear and convincing coming up uh, tomorrow night. going to be definitely interesting. Wanted to tell you before we brought our guests back on that I shared on my personal page, Lisa, the uh, the actual documents from Gizmodo. They actually have the full transcript of the lawsuit uh, there for your viewing pleasure. Um, I tried to tag Gail in it. it. I don't know. It didn't show up. But my page is completely public. Um, it's me and my beautiful fiance on it. Uh, if you want to go look at it. Um, yeah. Gail, you or Lisa, maybe you could find a way to share that with Gail uh, so that they could read that if they were quite interested in it and maybe that article. But, uh, again, um, we've got a bunch of a ton of stuff we've talked about, a lot more stuff we're going to get into. And so let's go ahead and pod them back into the show. Uh, welcoming back here in the last hour of uh, Behind the Curtain, it's um, Gail and Debbie, Gail Beatty, Debbie Ray of the Bigfoot Researchers of the Hudson Valley. That's a lot to say. <laughs> yes, it <Good> sure <laughs> is. <laughs> I'm long-winded because I like to hear myself talk. I'm not going to lie. Right. We can always talk. Yeah, we can talk on this subject. God knows. We love it. So let me <laughs> So here's what I want to get into uh this for a little for a little bit. Obviously we talked about in the opening. Uh <laughs> there's a lot of people that associate the whole Bigfoot thing with with comedy and, and joking, Oh look I'm Bigfoot, you know, and the Jack Links commercials don't help much. Uh yeah. But I wanted to ask you two two parts to this. Have you seen the uh, the show that Rob Lowe was doing, where he was actually in the Ozarks yeah. in Arkansas, but they say more Southern, and he literally uh, felt like he he encountered a Bigfoot, and he felt like he was he was about to be killed. He uh, he said, and that's going to yeah. air on an episode of that. So that's interesting, and it brings a little bit of validity, I would hope, to your efforts. Um, yeah. Well, tell me the negative impact that you receive in the in, in your endeavor to find, you know, factual proof that you can bring to the public 
with all of the 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 misconceptions that are out there and the ridicule that some people place upon, you know, uh, you go, I'm a Bigfoot researcher and, and people are instantly doing the smoking marijuana symbol and, you know, you're crazy <laughs> type thing. You know? So yeah, tell me yeah. how that has an impact on you as a Bigfoot researcher and does that hinder you at all, not maybe in your personal uh, goals to do it, but, you know, I mean, hey, I've got this information and people instantly right. want to discredit it. So can you tell me how you can overcome that and its impact on, on what you guys do? Well, we've we've come across, of course, you know, the rolling of the eyes. <laughs> like when you say I'm a Bigfoot researcher, especially when I first started in 2011, where, you know, Finding Bigfoot was on and everybody was watching it, but, you know, they're skeptical and whatnot, which I can understand, of course. But now it does not bother me or Debbie at all. I mean, let we know what we know. We've seen and experienced things that we, you know, we're just so confident in the fact that they are real and they're here and we know it, so we don't try to convince anyone we have run across some pretty hard, you know, trolls, like we'll put, put pictures on or whatever, and people, oh, well, that's blurry or whatever. Yeah, it's blurry, but, you know, we're out there, boots on the ground. We're doing the research. So, you know, they can sit there behind their computer and, and be trolls and, you know, like badmouth you, but they're not out there looking or searching or trying to find out the truth. They're just, like, criticizing other people. So I don't let it bother me anymore. I don't think Debbie does either. You know, occasionally somebody will make a, a rude remark, and now we just uh, take them off. You know, we don't even bother getting upset. We just to, uh, delete them, their comment and, and unfriend them. <laughs> so that's the easiest way that we do. But most people are receptive to it, and children especially are very – you know, interested in the subject. So Debbie and I had um, last summer taken a group of about 56 kids at a camp out on, uh, well, first we did a presentation at this camp about maybe seven miles from my home. And it's in rural Columbia County, more farms up there than here. But um, we we did the presentation first, showed the kids the tracks, explained what to look for, and then we took her a walk. And the counselors were there. I think there were four counselors and then Debbie and I. We started walking, and we were filming as we walked with our camera glasses that day. And the kids were amazing, and they found a track. And it was like about, I think, seven inches, and it was little toes, and we cast it. And they were like, oh, look at this. Oh, you know, they were so excited. We gave them little certificates of completion of this uh, little Bigfoot class that we had given them. So they're, like, so open to it, and their eyes are so sharp, and, you know, their senses. So I think more and more as the subject gets out there that more and more people are saying, wait a minute, you know, thousands of people across the country and the world have witnessed and had encounters. So how can all of these people be crazy or hallucinating or whatever? So I think, you know, as more and more sightings happen and encounters, um, I think eventually it's going to have to come out. It has to. Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, there are a lot of, there's some negativity out there, you know, but we, we do kind of rise above it. Uh, you know, we try to just, you know, put a good spin on what we do. We, we we like to share what we've experienced out there, and there's always going to be somebody that says, what are you taking pictures of the potato camera again? You know, why is everything so blurry? You know, it's it's them. It's it's not the camera. It, it's not necessarily your movement it, it's them they you can take the same picture a few minutes later and it's it's clear but you know it's certain and nothing's there um but you know we do the best we can as 
skill. He says, we're not experts. We're all learning. And we put it out there on, on Facebook and uh, share with other researchers. This is something a lot more learning. And so if we don't learn from each other, what good is this? You know, share our experiences, uh, share um, what we've learned. You know, you say, oh, hey, I was at this nature preserve and X, Y, Z happened, or uh, what do you think of this? If we can't share information and share what we've learned, you might as well just sit home and watch The Bachelor, Mm. you know, which is what I should be doing tonight. But anyway, um, just sit home and watch TV. You know, let Mountain Monsters do it. Let Finding Bigfoot do it. Um, you know, we at least we get out there. You know, we 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 get out there and talk to uh, groups of children, Girl Scout troops, uh, a day camp we went to, and these kids are are energized, which also you know got us to put together this children's book that we wrote, mm-hmm. and um, hopefully a lot more kids will get into it. We kept it simple. It's it's a little Native American history. And a little bit of what we do when we go out there. And there's uh, three or four stories in the back, too, which are based on true events. And we just want people to go out there, but mainly be safe. Everybody, adults and children, don't go alone and be safe. I mean, you just don't know what's out there. Um, It it could be mountain lions. It could be a snake. It could be a bear. Whatever. It's just just always be safe, but if we don't share information out there, and that's what that's the only thing that aggravates me with some people, we're putting information to share, but then they have to be critical, and give, give us a break. We're we're just putting it out there. Tell me what you think, and if you think it's nothing, just say nothing, but don't be rude. It's I I just don't think anybody should be rude. There's a lot of people putting a lot of time. And this isn't cheap either to get cameras and chips. And if you invest in a thermal camera, you could go broke. Um, You know, the gas material, I get it from California. Um, So, you know, there's a lot of little things. And And we don't make any money. No, we don't make any money doing it. We're not BFRO that charges, what, four to $600 to go out and investigate. Right. If somebody calls Gail and says, oh, I, I had an, an encounter, you know, we go out, we don't charge. Right. And we'll go out and we'll look for you and um, take pictures and videotape and uh, with their permission. Right. And we're discreet. We, we, don't, we don't say where we were other than maybe a town. Mm-hmm. Um, when Gail came to my house, she said, oh, can I put this on YouTube? And I said, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so my encounter is on I uh, the YouTube channel uh, under Hudson Valley Squatch One, so you could find it okay. February 15th. And um, I didn't care; I just wanted to share it, and uh, so you could see that. But it just the only thing that uh, the noise us is when people are rude. I think, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, and and unfortunately, you know, even doing a show like this, uh, because what I did, I modeled this show after. Uh, the famous Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. I'm not a big yep. George Nury fan. Not a George Nury fan, I'm sorry. But, um, you know, and people look at you like you're crazy. when you Because a lot of ours is based around the paranormal. And I think right. that, that it's because people don't... when We as humans have a hard time at times with an understanding of something we can't see or... Uh, you know, there's little evidence. We know we have to have that physical proof in our hands before we can truly accept it. And what I was going to say, Lisa had a question, uh, but before we go to her question, I was going to also say, I'm going to, if I don't know if y'all ever make your way down here, but in September or October, we have a MacArthur uh, military museum. And there's a group of people that we've actually been a part of. Uh, we've actually set up a booth down there, but it's the Arkansas Paranormal Expo, and Ooh. there's Bigfoot researchers and you know aliens and and all of that stuff. Plus, you know the spiritual and supernatural stuff. And they do uh, they have guest speakers that come and talk. And if you would like, I can get a hold of the lady that runs that and Ooh. put y'all in contact with her, and maybe if y'all can find a way or, or get the time to come down for that. Maybe y'all can 
work out a spot to do like a, a guest speaker or something like that, or just come be a part of it and bring the, yeah, that the Hudson great. Valley researcher deal down there and set up a booth. It's really a neat little two day deal. And the proceeds kind of go to help uh, preserve the MacArthur uh, military museum. So I'll, uh, I'll definitely be getting a hold of somebody and giving them y'all's information and maybe y'all can, can hook up. And then when y'all, if y'all are able to come down, uh, we're probably going to plan on trying to be down there this year and get some interviews and stuff for shows uh, for in the future. And maybe we can have you all on live and in, in person down there as well. So I'll definitely try to get, if that's something you inter- you're interested in doing. Yeah, we would. We're we at, yeah, hey, we're doing, going. Yeah, we're doing a, a, a thing like that in May. Uh, yes. yes, at Pine Bush, New York. There's uh, Pine Bush, New York is the UFO cap. And every May they have a Pine Bush Fair. And uh, we... We do uh, go over to the meetings, and you know, I, I just like to expand my my brain and know as much as I can about what's going on out there. Because people have said that you, uh, these Bigfoot come from another planet. I know Dr. Matt Johnson subscribes to that belief, and um, other people do see UFOs and stuff. We had a couple of strange encounters, also. I, I just like to you know, uh, draw a line from A to B. So I, I keep my mind open. Uh, but they have a fair in May, and we're going to be speaking at that and selling the children's books and yeah. some Bigfoot glasses And um, that one of our team members, Pam Payne, yeah. she does a stunning job. Um, they are really beautiful. So, uh, yeah, you know, we do, we do like to do that. But we'll, we'll come to Arkansas. I've never been there. Yeah. Let's go there. Well, I, I tell you right now, you, y'all both are on Facebook, or Gail, you're on Facebook. Uh, you can go to Facebook. It's the Arkansas Paranormal Expo. Um, the MacArthur Museum of Arkansas Military History Benefit, October 6th and 7th of 2018. Uh, the website is www.arkansasparanormalexpo.com. Um, if you go to their Facebook page, again, the event is uh, the 8th Annual uh, Paranormal Expo. Really a neat little thing, uh, a wide variety of um, people and, and interest and things like that. There's actually a Bigfoot research group out of Conway that was there the year we were there. And uh, actually, I kind of invited myself to – remember that, Michael? I invited myself on a Bigfoot hunt because I feel like if I go with you – you're going to actually catch the first proof because I attract <laughs> stuff like that. Y'all have never okay, seen my ex wife, have you? I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> she doesn't listen. Oh, I'm not promise. listening. Oh, good. good. No, I, no, I can tell you right now, this show doesn't make any money, so she could care less. Oh, God. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. I'm sorry. I promise. Her attorney might listen. <laughs> Um, Lisa has a question she wanted to ask, so go ahead, Lisa. No, I, I thought of something. Uh, you all said that you've had them around your house. Yeah. Have you thought about putting up security cameras because the technology is phenomenal now? Yeah. And they would we, trigger with movement, and you would have, right. you know, 24-hour coverage. Yeah, they're pretty smart about the cameras. Um, oh. I've tried trail cams, you know, which are like they'll take video as well. You know, if you put mm-hmm. them to that or stills. And once in the beginning when I first started, we had five trail cameras out at this habituation site. And we had them uh-huh. like facing each other and, you know, so on along a creek on either side of the creek, and, you know, we did catch the shoulder of one, but they're so smart that that they will avoid the cameras or they'll sneak behind them and turn them. Um, You know, they're very, very clever. We do have one picture that the homeowner had gotten on a trail cam, and it's a juvenile Sasquatch. We believe it's a female, and she was in a tree, like... uh, eating like some kind of raw meat so we have a picture of her and we, he named her baby the homeowner and uh, we do have a picture of baby in the tree from the trail cam but it's very difficult 
but it, it isn't impossible because there's oh. one guy in Vermont that got a picture of a mother on his trail cam because something was eating all the apples off of one of his trees in the end of his driveway, but just like one section of the tree. So he put the trail camera up, and sure enough, it was a mother Bigfoot, and I think there was a little baby clinging to her, and he, she was bent over picking up apples off the ground, and he did get a picture of her. And there's been a few others, so it isn't impossible. Yeah, yeah that's okay. a good thing. Yeah. And, 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 the, some of, and the, camera be, the camera being moved out of position, yeah, that could also serve as quasi evidence because I've seen yeah. paranormal investigators that use mm-hmm. that because you can tell there's no humans around. Right. There are no shadows indicating a person, and yet the right. camera turns. So yeah, yeah. That but that is interesting that they're that that savvy. Yes. Of oh, something. they know. They know. Like when I I've said this on other shows that when we go to this one specific area, we have to park in a parking lot. And and we film, like, you know, we put the film glasses on right away. Even before we get out of the car, we turn on our cameras. And these things are watching us when we get out of that car. They're, like, um, they, they have certain ones like that. They will um, be, like, guards or something. And they watch us. And they right. know what a camera is. They know what a gun is. I mean, they are savvy. They've been watching us for centuries probably. You know, they know our habits and, like, around this house, they know what time we get up, you know, when I go out to feed my chickens or, you know, they just know. Right. And they are stealthy and they have certain ones that they put up, you know, as guards and the others are off foraging or, you know, feeding or whatever. Yeah, it's amazing how smart they are. You know, people don't give them credit. When I first started this, I thought I was looking for some big hairy ape in the woods, but they are so intelligent that they probably put us to shame. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, we know yeah. we know now that primates are self-aware. Oh, yeah. They can they can yeah. look in a mirror and know that know that's them. Yeah. So There's I think one you know, that... if, hmm. if they're primate species or descendants, Right. Then they're going to have that same self awareness. Yeah, there's one uh, gorilla that uses a computer. I mm-hmm. forget the name of her, but a man came into my bait shop because I have a little bait and tackle shop, and he worked with this this ape, this gorilla, and um, I think she recently died or something. He was telling me all about it, but he would be there and. You know, she, and the, the handler was the teaching her all this stuff on the computer. It was writing stuff. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it's amazing. So these things, can you imagine how intelligent they are? I, it's just hard to yeah. believe. Yeah. It really is. It's fascinating. Once you get into this, it changes your whole life. Like my family in the beginning wasn't too keen on the whole idea, but... Since then, you know, they know it's a way of life and it's, I'm never going to stop looking and searching for the answers. So now they're more supportive. But, you know, it well, took them good. a while. Yeah. 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 And like Debbie and I, said, the book is good because we're trying to help, like, young people learn about them, you know. So that's our main focus now, I guess, is, is – um, you know, bringing awareness and um, trying to, you know, share our knowledge with other people and young people. They're our future, and they have to know that these things are real and they're out there. And, you know, the book is called A Young Researcher's Guide to Bigfoot. And it's okay. on Amazon. You can find it on Amazon, barnesandnoble.com. And um, yeah, we message us and we we ship out signed copies too. So that's, we'll have to send you a copy. That, that sounds great. Thank you so much. And I wanted to say I'm sorry about the bad experiences, but unfortunately, the internet has just uh, 
basically eradicated good manners in a lot of people. Oh, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Because I, I'm a skeptic to mm-hmm. a degree, but yeah. I want to learn, and I'm respectful <laughs> of other people's right. experiences and beliefs. Right. You know, hey, Lisa. That's, that's, you know, the good way of life. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. I was going to tell anyone that was listening that's going to be in the Arkansas area, uh, just looking through the Arkansas Paranormal Expo, obviously they they advertise uh, events in the state. Um, the 2018 Arkansas Bigfoot Conference will be April 21st at the Conway Arkansas Expo Center. Uh, bigger place and better than ever. It's $12 per person at the door. Uh, obviously, if you go to Arkansas Paranormal Expo, on Facebook, and you like that page, or you can follow that page. Uh, they say that more information is to come. So, uh, the 2018 Bigfoot Arkansas Bigfoot Conference uh, will be April 21st in Conway. If anyone listening will be in the area or is in the area, would be interested in that as well. And I've reached out, also Gail and Debbie, to the organizer of the event, and I will pass your information along to her or. You feel free to message them yourselves or whatnot, and uh, we'll definitely see if we can get you guys a spot in that if you're interested in it and uh, right. try to help you make contact with them as well. Thank you. That sounds like fun. The only problem I have is it's right in the middle of my busiest season at my bait shop because we have the striped bass that come up the river to spawn. So April is like a nut house here with folks and <laughs> customers and oh my god! But maybe I can do it. It's only two days, right? That well, now the, the the expo itself is October the sixth and seventh. Oh, that's October. Oh, okay. The the, big, um, the conference itself is April twenty uh, first. Um, okay. And I I've never that. been to that one, but. Uh, I have oh. been to the expo, and they've, in fact, on the 12th of this month, or the 12th of March, uh, we're going to have Adrian Scalp of the River Valley Paranormal X, uh, Research Group, uh, who's mm-hmm. a keynote speaker in, in, in one of those, in that, in that expo, um, and he's actually told me that I can go on a ghost hunt with them as well. That, that'll be something. I'm, <laughs> oh. I'm not sure I'm... Yeah, I'm not looking uh, forward to that. I'm thinking about doing it live. Thank God for the wow. internet because because yeah. I'm pretty sure that I can scream like a little girl and say four letter words. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and the right. FCC won't say nothing. Apologize. No, uh, trust me. <laughs> That's the one thing people are like. Don't let it follow you. Don't let it. No. I hope it gets lost. And if it's like yeah. if ghost GPS is like human GPS, it will get lost. <laughs> That's funny. Jeez. But uh, hmm. so you know, like Lisa was saying with the technology, have you guys ever thought about doing the drone thing? And because I'm, yeah, I mean, we I almost thought. You go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. Tell me about your experience with the drone. Well, what I was like, thinking was is that with the drone. You know, obviously you can fly those things at a fairly, uh, you know, a good height if you're good enough to do them. I've just bought one, or I was given one for Valentine's Day, and I've played around with it. It's a little bit awkward at first to learn how to do, but once you kind of get the hang of it, I feel like that would be a valuable tool in the Bigfoot research because now you're up above them, and, yeah. and unless they, you know, evolve you know, and their intelligence to, to look up and see that they're being whatever. I feel like you could get better angles and you could get in on them a, a lot less undetectable from the air. Right. Obviously, this, right. this footage from 20, 2015 that was shown, um, I think that would be something that would be beneficial. Have you guys pursued that in any form or, or looked into it? My, we did look at them. We were over where? That's fine. Yeah. And we did look at them. And my son, one of my sons actually had one, and he was messing around, and he lost his. <laughs> and it was not a cheap one either. He, it got away from him somehow and crashed into trees, and he never got it back. But it wouldn't be bad for, like, this time of year in the winter 
when there's no leaves on the trees, it would be an asset to us. So I, I might look into that, definitely. Anything that will help, you know. I mean, they're pretty yeah. good at hunting, but they don't have a lot of cover this time of year. And if it was snow on the ground, it'd probably be even better, you know. Definitely. So if someone was interested in pursuing, you know, as a hobby, obviously, you know, like you were saying, unless you're one of the bigger organizations like the BRFO, I yeah. guess, you know, there's you can't make any money at this. This is a pure hobby. Yeah. It's kind of like ghost hunting, unless you're right. able to, to land that, that television deal. Um, mm-hmm. So where would someone go to start? Like, let's say that uh, me, Michael, and Lisa want to, you know, pursue this. Now, obviously, you have to find an area where, you know, there's been purported activity or, or movement. Um, but do you, you know, you, you said stay in a group, but is there is there any sites or information that, that have been put together for people to kind of, you know, ha- habits and, and and things of that nature? Well, actually, you know, I listen to a lot of the podcasts and I learn from every single person, you know, that calls in and talks about their experiences. But what we do, and I've started doing this from the beginning, is find a water source because every animal needs water and the Bigfoot is no different. And then I start from the water source and you know, go around the shoreline or if it's a, a creek or river or lake, it doesn't matter. Start looking for your track then expand out, look for your breaks, your stick structures, your bows and, you know, boat over uh, things and just work your way around, look for caves, um, you know, just anything out of the ordinary, rocks stacked up. And, yeah, believe me, you're, you're going to find them. It's not going to be that hard, but you can also go to um, nature preserves where there's no hunting, and that's where we've had a lot of success. But, you know, by farms, um, uh, they love pine trees. They use the pine boughs as bedding, um, and they're good. They like to climb trees, and you can uh, see on Facebook some, I think Claudia just put on her site, Claudia Ackley, a woman had filmed two of them up really tall pine trees. Yep. So, you know, really, I, I found them in the most unlikely of places. You know, be, behind a church, we did an investigation. The priest had a, had a sighting at this church, or the minister, it wasn't a Catholic church, and then um, the man that was the caretaker for the church, one night there was an event going on. He had to go out to his car in the parking lot, and he got growled at. So he had us up there, and we found a track there. We found so much evidence of the Sasquatch on this church property. But they owned um, quite a few acres behind the church, and it was in a, a camp at one time, a kid's camp. And it's since been abandoned. So there are several buildings on this camp property that nobody really even goes back there. And there's a clan of Sasquatch living on this property. So, you know, you don't know. You just got to put your boots on the ground and get out there. You know, a park, state park. Um, Scott Carpenter has a place in Tennessee where he has found so much evidence. And it's in state park. Like, just go off the trail a little bit, and you'll find stuff. You know, just keep looking. But you have to know what to look for. And that's why Debbie and I share, like, whenever we find a structure or a track or a tree break or anything, we share it online and try to teach people this is what you have to look for. Because sometimes the signs are subtle. And you'll just say, oh, well, this might have just, you know, been – a break due to uh, ice or snow or something, but then you'll look and it, it's twisted, and that doesn't happen in nature, you know. So yeah, I mean we try to do our best to share our knowledge, but you know you can learn a lot by just watching things on YouTube as well. 
Sorry about that. I don't know why my we're having some we're having some technical difficulties here. I don't. I thought the, the mic was hot. Lisa, um, Michael, pot her back up for a bit. So, Lisa, we've got about eighteen, nineteen minutes left here, and what has been a fascinating, fascinating discussion tonight. Um, you know, anytime you enter, uh, like I've always said, when you enter a show and you look up and you're in the uh, at the home stretch for all you horse racing uh, fans out there. <laughs> And you're like, wow, where did it go? Uh, then you know you've had a, a wonderful time and, and had a very entertaining guest. So we appreciate you uh, two ladies for, for, for coming on and, and educating uh, our listeners and, and myself, and, and I'm sure Lisa as well. Um, oh, definitely. Thank I'm you. Still, I still go back to, though, uh, in the initial part of this interview, you know, your experience you said up there, you know, you obviously had no idea what was about to happen. You know, this was probably something you just went up there to, you know, have, you know, goof off or whatever. And, um, you know, and then the thing that got me was, is you had that experience and then it was, we're, I mean, I would imagine if, if I'm not hearing that wrong, we're talking not just a few years, there were years in between before you realized what had happened. Correct. Oh yeah. Yeah. I did not know anything until that night when I heard that howling on the uh, animal planet, and it was like stopped dead in my tracks and clicked and then went on the computer and then found out, yeah, there was one sighted right on my road where I lived. And that wow. was in the 80s. I think that was in 86, I believe, when the... Two women saw the one cross the road right down the road from my house. So that was like 20 years later. And here it's like another 20 years. So there was a long time in between, definitely. And then so I've had another experience that I'll tell you briefly and uh, before we close. Um, I had met this gentleman several years ago that uh, approached me. At, I was set up in the town with the Bigfoot tracks and whatever, and he found out about me through, you know, friends. And he had built a house about five miles from here, and he was from the city. So he built this brand-new house on this nice piece of property with a creek running through it, and he had a pond dredge. And... Um, his workers uh, left their machine, you know, the, the dredging machine out in the front of his house. So one night he heard something outside. He opened his front door, and he's looking at this creature standing by this big machine. And it was like eight foot tall, black and hairy. He thought it was a bear, just, you know, being from the city, and he didn't know anything about big or anything. So he thought it was a bear. He ran in the house, locked the door or whatever. So uh, the next day or two, the workers came up to him and said, you know, around this pond they just dredged with all, you know, fresh dirt. And they're seeing these enormous footprints, you know, human-like tracks all around the pond. So that led him to me. So I started investigating there. And, oh, my God, this place is crazy. Um, he has them up, you know, on his porch, moving his uh, yard furniture, scratching on the screen of his windows, tapping on the, you know, windows at night, smacking the side of his house, blowing rocks in him when he's on his tractor. Um, just all kinds of different things happen there. So anyway, we did a lot of investigating there and one night on um, December 30th of 2013 13 or 14 2014 I took some guys out that had a clear camera from Massachusetts myself and the homeowner and we we knew the Sasquatch were out there we always knew that and so we started going out. It was dark. It was real cold that night. There was ice on the ground, some snow. And we started walking towards this fence where the homeowner was feeding them. He was gifting them food every night. So we started walking. Well, as soon as I stepped out on the porch, they pushed a tree down. 
So I said, come on, guys, hurry up. You know, they're, they're just knocked the big tree down. So we started walking towards the uh, fence in the creek, and the Bigfoot went crazy. They started breaking down these enormous live trees, just snapping them like pretzels, just breaking, you know, you hear crack smashing down in the water. The guy with the FLIR got five of them on the FLIR camera that night. And then uh, it just got crazy after that. And I said, let everybody just get back to the house. Two of the guys that were facing the creek, the homeowner and one other guy, Dave, saw this blue light go up into the sky, and then everything went dead silent. (laughs) So, anyway, that was probably the second scariest night of my life. But we do have the footage from the FLIR but we can't put it out publicly because the homeowner does not want it publicized. And so Les Stroud, the survivor man guy, you know, that has the TV show, he was here two years ago, and we showed him the footage, and he was quite impressed. And uh, I've showed a few other people, but I can't put it out to the public, unfortunately, without the homeowner's permission. But that night was pretty darn scary. That changed the lives of all of us because they could have easily jumped over this little rickety fence and popped our heads off or done whatever they wanted, and there wouldn't have been anything we could do. But they didn't, so we're still here. Oh, man, that's uh, (laughs) – and I guess, you know, when people go out in the woods, they associate, you know, like – mountain lions and coyotes and things of that nature to be faced to these creatures, the, the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot are in what, in most conceptions, they're what they're massive creatures that, that have human uh, characteristics, the arms, the legs, they stand upright and we're talking tall, like, I mean, yeah. in most most uh, most people believe them to be, um, you know, above human, you know, height and right. massive strength. I don't know, like, at least pod Lisa up real quick. I mean, Lisa, honestly, I can't imagine being in the woods at night alone is is creepy enough for me. But to to hear a noise or a screech or a whine or a wail of whatever, and to look up and potentially see something like that i can't imagine where i would be mentally and physically (laughs) having seen that i mean um it would be i mean i i could imagine real terror because the scream sounds like a cross or a combination of a woman screaming bloody murder and a pig squealing yeah Yeah. Yeah. all of the all of the north american Species are described as between six and a half and eight feet tall. I think some have been described as even taller than that. Yeah. Yep. And they're yep. also very, they, the depictions are always very broad-shouldered, uh, very large, not just tall, but very large and imposing figures. Oh, yeah. Um, they so are. I could imagine, I mean, face-to-face, Within a few feet, I could imagine real terror. Oh yeah, it's oh, crazy. Just... So, I I well, I don't know if I would want it. to find them. <laughs> yeah, because I think I don't I say we're crazy to even be doing this, but <laughs> I don't know emotionally where that would put me. Yeah. Um, in and I you know I live in New Orleans where. It's pretty scary sometimes. Oh yeah, uh, with the oh, crime yeah. rate. But I, I just I don't know if I would want to find it. Yeah, I know. I know. Sometimes I think we are crazy, but it's like <laughs> if you just want to know the truth. You know, like right. what do you want? Why are they here? Um, right. Some of the native uh, people believe, and this is kind of scary in a way, that when the Earth is in time of great trouble, that the Sasquatch 
are there, like they're sent here as watchers, watchers of the planet, because the earth is in trouble. We know that. The world is in trouble. And right. that's what they're here, maybe, you know, to protect the earth, to, you know, give us a message. So that's what I kind of think, because so many people are having encounters now. And and the dog man, that's a whole other subject. That's a topic for another show. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. That's well, coming more and more as well. But we can um, save that for another night. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I did find some information on Miss Ackley's suit oh, good. Uh, in San Bernardino County. Mm-hmm. Um, it is scheduled for a status hearing on um, March 19th okay. in right. Department S-26 at the uh, county court in San Bernardino. Oh, good. I thought it county. was the 18th, but it's the 19th. Good. It's the 19th at 8.30 a.m. Wow. And um, so I'll, the documents aren't available online, but I'll I'll keep an eye on it. Great, because I'm going to um, definitely share this show with Claudia. I told her I was going to be on, uh, on it tonight, but I'm going to share it as well to my Facebook page and YouTube and everywhere. But Claudia will hear this, and I hope it will help her. Great. Yes, definitely. And uh, I, I was reading the, the petition, and like I said, it is a novel and an interesting concept. Yeah. So we'll we'll see if if she succeeds. That'll be great. Yes. And you know, and and y'all, you do know, and y'all know that. Uh, if she would like a forum other than, I mean, obviously with a pending lawsuit, I'm sure there's stuff she can and can't say, but she is more than welcome, and I'm sure Lisa wouldn't mind as well. She is more than welcome to, to reach out to, to myself or Lisa and tell her story live on this show at any time that she feels like uh, or is able to do that. We, uh, you know, we don't, uh, we're always looking for that next guest. Um, yeah. To, to fill content and uh, to get the information out to people. And, you know, when I was going through Facebook, I typed in Bigfoot and I found you guys. And I, again, appreciate you all for, for responding and coming on the show. Um, again, definitely one of uh, one of our better uh, interviews that we've done, or I've done personally doing this. Um, you know, the last Bigfoot person that I had on was, was informational, but there was, you know, it was kind of a a mundane type atmosphere, and and I think you guys have really brought the entertainment value to the to the is, show as well. So we appreciate you uh, for taking the time out of your day, especially uh, considering the time difference. I know it's getting late up there, and and we're about to have to end the show, but uh, just wanted to say uh, from the bottom of. Uh, you know, my heart, I appreciate you guys for coming on the show and, and telling your story and, and talking about your group. Uh, so we got about four minutes left. So if y'all want to talk about how people could get in contact with you or anything else, I know you had said you had a book out. If you want to plug that a little, uh, go ahead. It's, it's all you. All right. Thank you. Um, it's called A Young Researcher's Guide to Bigfoot. And it's on Amazon. Oh, Debbie's leaving. Just say bye. Debbie's going. Sorry, bye, I have Debbie. to Boston tomorrow. But thank you for having us. Oh, no thank problem. You. Thank you, Debbie. Okay. All right. Drive safe. Um, okay. Um, also, we're on Facebook under Bigfoot Researchers of the Hudson Valley. And, and we're on YouTube under Hudson Valley Squatch One. <laughs> and... Uh, I think I have a Twitter, but I guess it's Gail Baby. And then we do have a website called BigfootResearcher.com. And I tell you right now, if you'll send me that information via Messenger or on a link, I will share those along the Behind the Curtain page and the Talk Radio 49 page. And also... Um, I will message you the link to this show that's archived so that uh, you yeah. can distribute that to whoever may want to tune in and listen. 
Um, again, check out their book at Amazon.com. Um, sounds really good, and I may actually purchase a copy for uh, my sister just gave birth to my second nephew a couple of days ago, but uh, oh. nephew number one uh, oh. it just turned will be three in July, and uh, I may pick up a copy for him to to, to read at some point. Um, oh, fantastic, fantastic! Thank you, guys. Thank you, Lisa. And Pat, Thank I you. really appreciate it. I love you guys, and I'm going to share this all over the internet. <laughs> and oh, for Claudia Thank too. You. Yes, for Claudia too. Thank you for the help, and I will pass this along to her because she will need our support. And you know, I think this is great. Definitely, if she wants oh, to contact me through Facebook, yes, uh, I have no problem with that. Okay, I will definitely message her in the morning. I don't know. She's in California, so that's even more of a time difference. But I, I will. <laughs> Thank you, guys. A, Thank you. Not a problem. I, in fact, we appreciate it. That was uh, Gail Beatty and Debbie Ray of the Bigfoot Researchers of the Hudson Valley. And Lisa, like I was saying before, you know, I don't just say that, um, you know, just to be saying it. You know, having done this podcast for a couple years and having a little bit of radio experience, uh, you know, there are those guests that you that you come across, Lisa. That you know, when you when you hear about Bigfoot or you hear about the subject nature, you know, you you wonder how it's going to go because you don't know the people that you're interviewing. But when you look up and you're at the end of the show and you wish there was more. You know, you you know that you you've had a very entertaining, educational, and informative guest, and that's Definitely. where I think we went with that tonight. I really am happy that that we were able to reach out to them and that they were able to come on. And yes. from the you know, like I said, I hope that that they are or, or someone validates their work as well, or maybe they validate their own work to the public, and that Bigfoot is exposed for being a legit real thing i really do because i honestly believe that there's no way possible that that bigfoot cannot exist uh because of i mean we're we're in a huge world and there's things that we discover on a daily basis that uh you wouldn't think were was possible five years ago ten years ago that that everything keeps coming to the forefront so i think that right. eventually this is going to be that there that there's going to be evidence and all these people that have been trolled over the years are going to go, you know what? We tried to tell you, but, you know, the, the out of the goodness of their heart, they're just going to keep pursuing and finding more information. So uh, best of luck to them as well. Um, obviously, Lisa, we got about a minute left, so let's go ahead and plug your show coming up tomorrow, Clear and Convincing. Um, you got to have a precursor tomorrow for – what the show is going to be about. You're going to take some cases and talk about them from the right. legal concept. Uh, go ahead and All explain right. your and show real quick. All right. Um, Claire and Convincing is going to be about uh, controversial cases, but we're going to look at them from the perspective of the court and what information was presented to the court and explain why the courts did not do what the public who believe in innocence because of media articles and social media did not do what they wanted them to do. And tomorrow's show is going to be kind of to uh, provide a little bit of information about the criminal system, the process, the structures, and the burdens of proof and defined terms, and kind of clear up misconceptions that people have about how the system works. Absolutely, and that sounds so entertaining, and I can't wait to listen to that. Remember, on the reel on Sundays, Mike and Mike at night on Wednesdays, ASWF Aftermath on Thursdays, ASWF Saturday nights on Saturdays when there's a show, and of course, this show behind the curtain. Michael, it's been fun, it's been real, and it has been real fun. We appreciate Gail Beatty, Debbie Ray of the Bigfoot Researchers of the Hudson Valley for coming on. Tonight, Lisa, we are going to get out of here. So to everyone involved, 
Good night. We will see y'all next week as we break down the meaning connection with Linda Ives, uh, investor, investigator Keith, and Billy Jack Haynes. You're not going to want to miss it. It's a special episode of Behind the Curtain. We'll see y'all later. Good night, everybody.